I'm delighted right. to introduce our Please, first uh, uh, plenary speaker, <laughs> Aksai Gupta. Aksai is a faculty member at the University of Edinburgh, um, and this is in the School of Mathematics. Prior to this, Aksai was at Clemson in the USA. Uh, so the title of this conversation is Mixed Integer Conic Optimization from Duality to Convex Whole Characterizations. Um, we're going to keep this uh, entire uh, sort of presentation plus questions to 30 minutes. Um, I'm going to be quite strict about this just because we have to get th through the rest of everything else. However, there's a breakout room afterwards and Aksai has kindly uh, agreed to stay and uh, talk a bit more about his presentation. So Aksai, really looking forward to your presentation. All right, thanks. Uh, thanks, Ruth, Tian, uh, Pietro, and Miguel for putting together a nice workshop. I, I know all of us wish we uh, were in person in London, but uh, I think it's, it's, it's still what it is, and, and I'm glad we could all get together for these two days. All right, so I'm going to talk about yeah, mixed integer conic problems, uh, well, mainly theoretical talk, but essentially uh, talking about convex hull descriptions and how duality uh, plays a role in, in helping us derive these things. And, uh, and this is some ongoing work with, uh, uh, with my three co-authors. All right, so one thing I would say is, uh, yeah, uh, I'm not too well, so my voice is a bit deep and hoarse. So if you have any issues, uh, then just, uh, I guess, uh, raise your hands or flag to one of the moderators. Uh, but hopefully my, my voice is loud and clear. All right, so just a general problem setting. So mixed integer conic problem, so, Sort of yeah, just take uh, two cones, a C and K. We sort of uh, I denote this general say Euclidean space, but essentially by that it means you can just think of uh, your usual uh, vector space where we think of vectors as arrays essentially. Uh, but in a more general vector setting, even matrices form a vector space. So your cones could be in a matrix space or uh, like the PSD cone, or it could be in the standard vector space like uh, you know the orthint or or, or the SOCP code. Um, and, and, and as a standard, you have these uh, conic linear inequalities, which are basically the generalization of what we see in linear programming with, with AX less than B. So hopefully this is, uh, many people have seen this, but if you have not, then uh, this is what it is. It's just saying that B minus AX is in this cone K. All right, and this defines a partial order uh, when, when the cone is pointed. All right, so this is the problem. Uh, just uh, optimize a linear function over this mixed integer conic set given by, uh, so essentially two sets of conic constraints. So right, the uh, so the variable x is in a cone C, close convex cone C, and then you also have a separate set of these linear conic constraints ax less than b over this cone k. And uh, we are looking at the mixed integer problem. So the first P of these uh, variables are, are constrained to be integer. And, and P onwards up to N are, are continuous. All right, so, so this is a rich class of problems under convex M I N L P. It's convex because the cones that I'm looking at are assumed to be convex cones. So of course they are an extension of mixed integer linear problems because if you just take polyhedral cones, then you get M I L P's. Um, so as such, one shouldn't be surprised, there is a lot of work on extending results from MILPs to this case of MICPs. <clears throat> so I'm mainly interested in, in convex hull descriptions. So there's, I've just cited all these uh, uh, papers and, and there's a lot of literature. So if I've missed any uh, and you're in the audience, then, then please forgive me. But um, most of the work, you see on, on cutting planes and valid inequalities has been on mixed integer SOCP, so where the cones are these Lorentz cones. Um, there's some work with uh, mixed integer SDP as well, and uh, there is, I guess, lesser and probably more recent work on, on general cone. So Matthew yesterday uh, uh, gave his taster presentation about disjunctive cuts for MICPs, right? So how how you write these CGLPs when you have a split disjunction and try to separate cuts efficiently. And, uh, and but the, 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 there's a lot of other work. The, the part that is going to be sort of the most relevant to what I'm saying is are these more general convex hull descriptions. And so there's, there's work by uh, Fatma. I don't know if she's in the audience today, but she was there yesterday. So she has a lot of papers in this regard. And, uh, and there's some recent work also on the special mixed binary case. 
And of course, there are outer approximation algorithms and branch and cut methods to, to actually solve these problems uh, computationally. Right, so this talk is about convexifying this mixed integer conic set uh, without assuming any special structures. So I'm, I'm not assuming uh, the cones being SOCP or PSD or even uh, any particular uh, structure on, on the constraints. Okay, so it's, it's a very general setting and we'll make some mild assumptions later on to get uh, uh, get our theorems, but but otherwise the setting is, is fairly general. All right, so uh, so just a brief outline of uh, what our results are. So so the first main, or I guess the goal or sort of uh, the punchline is uh, being able to describe <coughs> <coughs> And the convex hull of this uh, mixed integer conic set with uh, linear inequalities. Of course, uh, in, in general, you would expect infinitely many because we are allowing for nonlinear cones. And, and the description of these or these uh, inequalities are generated using extreme rays of, a, of another close convex cone, which itself is obtained using the original cones from our problem, the C and the K, or, or, uh, or duals of these cones, and also the input data. Okay, so let me go back. Uh, if I didn't clarify, so in this setting, what I mean by the input data is basically this, this linear map A, the right-hand side B, right? And uh, so these maps and, and their elements. And of course, the other inputs are these cones C and K. So the result is about describing this convex hull of int essentially using all this input data. So two things here. So there is uh, something in this regard, in particular, describing these convex hulls using extreme rays of another cone. This is known for integer LPs due to, of, well, not very old, but fairly old work of Lasser uh, in this direction. And, uh, and and in fact, our approach of taking duality was inspired by some of uh, Lasser's uh, work from early 2000s, where there's connection between uh, super additive duality and uh, these uh, convex hull characterizations for integer LPs though. So we are looking at the more general mixed integer uh, conic case. What is an open question that we haven't explored yet, but sort of uh, if anybody's interested talking about it or uh, uh, is to explore uh, the connections between our results and descriptions to what is known uh, due to uh, Fatma's work and using what I call as these K minimal and K sublinear inequalities. So in particular, it is known that in a, for a general, fairly general MICP with some mild assumptions, you can describe the convex hull of X int um using uh, these minimal and sublinear inequalities okay so so what is the difference between our uh, theorem and and what is already known so so we have a different characterization it's not entirely clear if the characterization that we have is exactly the one matching that's in literature because there are a few differences the the set the setting considered in literature is slightly uh, is described in a slightly different way th than the MICP that I just showed on the first slide. Uh, so it's it's not just you look at two things and say oh they are they are the same. So there is some there's some work involved in, in forming the connections. And uh, the other thing is there are some necessary and sufficient conditions known for these minimal and sublinear inequalities. So so that is that is an open question that we haven't looked at in this work is. Uh, the description that we get exactly the same as uh, what is known through minimal and sublinear descriptions. But I think the key point uh, that I want to emphasize is how we get to this description of the convex hull. And that is definitely different from uh, what is known for mixed integer conic problems. So our, our approach, our, our route to getting to this uh, convex hull is, is through duality, strong duality for mixed integer conic problems. So <laughs> so on the way, <coughs> we get an extended formulation for the convex hull. And, and, then, and the third point being that we also get two strong duals for, for MICP. So the first one is basically a, um, a refinement on what is known in literature through, uh, through a couple of papers. And the second one is, is, is just a different strong dual that we develop using a new approach, but the second one is what we use for
for getting our first two results on this slide. Okay, so, <clears throat> all right, so just a slide about, yeah, so how do I, those first two results I talked about getting this convex hull description with valid inequalities and extended formulation. Um, so how, what, what is the general sense? So we use our second dual. So basically, I'll, I'll show you the dual uh, in a bit, but basically this dual can be written as, as a conic problem. So it's, it's uh, linear constraints. Uh, of course, there are exponentially many constraints as, as you would expect, because these are general unstructured problems. So we don't expect anything uh, compact pol or polynomial size. But the point being that the second rule that we have, you can just write the constraints as linear or conic constraints. And so once you write the, the description that way, you apply strong conic duality under you know, uh, constraint qualification, whatever uh, uh, that you need. And there are many constraint qualifications. So uh, this paper that I've cited uh, at the bottom is uh, is not what I'm talking about, but but that paper is just about uh, continuous uh, conic duality and characterizations of uh, strong duality and and bunch of other things, but just the continuous conic problem. So we use some uh, strong duality results from that companion paper in this uh, mixed integer conic paper. All right, and uh, and right, and and then so basically, so you have this strong uh, dual for MICP, you take uh, the continuous conic dual of that, and then you can show that after doing that, you get an extended formulation for X int, which was your mixed integer conic set. And then finally, oops, and then finally to get this characterization of valid inequalities in the original space, we use a projection result from our companion paper. So basically if, uh, so for those who know, uh, there is this, uh, so if you have polyhedral sets, so if you have a polyhedral set in a high dimension, you can project it to a lower dimension using these projection cones. And and for those who know, basically this projection cone involves taking extreme rays and, and all that. So the same thing can be done for conic sets. Of course, you have to be a lot more careful with, with conic sets because there are all these issues uh, that you need to deal with, like strong duality doesn't come for free. Um, but under mild assumptions, you can do that. And so once you have that extended formulation, we use this pr uh, projection result that we have and get all the valid inequalities. So that's why what I showed on the previous slide, this convex hull description ends up being basically one valid inequality for every extreme ray of some other cone. So this other cone is essentially this projection cone. All right. So that's uh, that's basically the general idea of of the contributions and 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 what we have. All right, so let's uh, dive into the details. So just basic notation. If you see, I've tried to keep it light on notation, but uh, I can't completely get rid of it, obviously. So so I have integer variables, continuous variables. This linear map, although it's mapping to a general Euclidean space, you can of course decompose it into the integer and continuous part, and then rest the standard stuff with adjoints and duals and uh, and all that. <laughs> All right, so just a uh, quick uh, this thing about super additive duality. So if uh, somebody is not familiar with this, uh, so there's a lot of literature on this uh, stemming from mixed integer linear problems, right? So if you have never seen, so these are, uh, so if your primal is a supremum, the dual is an infimum, as, as you would expect. And, but this uh, dual is in a functional space, right? So you have to look at all these functionals, which are super additive, monotone. And there's also this extremely nasty and pesky constraint that I've put in red, uh, which is basically taking a directional derivative, right? So, so the, the functionals that you have in the dual space have a constraint on their directional derivative has to be greater than CJ. And this is for the continuous part. Right, so for the integer part it's okay, but for the continuous variables, you have this directional derivative popping up, which makes this uh, dual, okay, in theory, yes, it is strong. And, uh, and a couple of papers have shown it recently that essentially it carries over also to the general mixed integer conic case with some slight modifications. But if I had to use this for, even writing it down or doing anything else, this directional derivative makes it 
basically intractable to do much with it. All right, but, but our first result in, in this uh, case is that uh, basically we give it a refinement. So we take this uh, dual from literature and we show that uh, basically there is a general class of sets S for which this is still a strong dual. Okay, so let me go back a slide. So, so here what is known from literature is that if you look at this dual, um, this is defined for functionals that are, uh, whose domain is the entire Euclidean space. Okay, so you have to look at all these functionals that are defined everywhere on E. So what we showed is that you can, you don't need functions that are defined everywhere on E. Just the way proof works out is that you have to look at, you have to just make sure that you include a correct uh, certain set of points. And then if you just have functional defined over those, then everything goes through. Okay, and so this, uh, uh, Correct set of points is the set S, which okay has to include the image of the set and first two three things, which are fairly technical. But I mean, they are the first three conditions are are fairly mild, I would say. Uh, the fourth one is what is the most interesting one uh, because it's sort of geometric, and I'll show on the next slide what it really means. And and I'll come on the last slide because it relates to uh, faces of of a cone and things like that. All right, so briefly speaking, uh, this notion of uh, what it means to uh, have conic some decomposability or, or a set to be some closed uh, over another cone is just means that if I have two vectors u and v in the cone and the sum of u and v is in the set S, then each of u and v should also be in the set S. All right, so that's just the definition. And, and for those of you who are familiar with uh, basic convex analysis, this should definitely remind you of faces of a convex set. So this definition in red is, is very, it's almost ditto how we define uh, faces of a convex set. Not exposed faces, but just general faces. That's how they are defined. And on the last slide, I have a diagram showing how all these things are connected. But basically that, but so if I go to the bottom of the slide, uh, if you just look at the very simple case, the set S being uh, this box between the origin and the vector B, then, um, then you can basically just uh, work out what it all means. The recession cone is, is this uh, negative RM plus and, uh, and cone of phase, uh, negative cone of phase is contained in that. Okay, but the bottom line being that if I just had a linear IP, uh, which was of the packing type, right? So then it is known that the super additive for the super additive dual, I can basically just uh, restrict the domain of the functionals to be this box zero comma B. So this is known from classical results from 70s from Johnson and Jaroslav and it's basically folklore, right? And, but this, but this box zero comma B in this linear IP setting uh, falls under this notion of some decomposability of a cone. So in the very general case, what you really need is these sets to be some decomposable over a code. All right, so, so that's the, the first result, but, but this dual is, as I said, still has directional derivatives because it's just a refinement on the literature dual. So it still has all those constraints. What we've just done is we have shrunk the domain of the functionals, okay? So, so our second dual is the one that gets rid of the directional derivatives and uh, takes a new approach. <coughs> so this is just an outline, for, again, for those who are not familiar uh, of how we get uh, these directional derivatives from. And, and the point being that you basically uh, split into the integer part, continuous part, the integer part, everything just goes through fine. For the continuous part, in one of these inequalities, you have this property of functionals that you can lower bound, but while lower bounding, you need this directional derivative f bar. So this f bar in red is the directional derivative. And in order to lower bound to get weak duality, um, this directional derivative is used. So that's where the directional derivative comes from in these, in these strong duals. All right, so, so the key point is that uh, for the continuous part, that's where it arises. So what we're gonna do is, uh, we're going to do something different for the continuous part so that we don't have directional derivatives. <coughs> All right, so, so here's our, our description of our dual. So, 
So one thing I need to assume is that uh, I'm going to have to separate the problem into its integer truncation and continuous truncation. And so for that, I'll need to assume that uh, this constraint x in C, so remember x are all the variables, integer and continuous. So x in C, I'll have to de assume that this uh, cone C is decomposed into C1 and C2. So there is one cone for the integer variables and one cone for the continuous variables, okay? Of course, I still have the other constraints ax less than b, right? So there everything can be uh, just put together, but these other constraints I have to decompose. So it's it's not a very restrictive assumption because, all right, so the dual problem is this uh, min-max problem, in soup problem in, in the space of uh, some functionals f, but I also have these variables y. Um, now these variables y, of course, are, there's one variable for every uh, vector in the set S. Okay, so there's enumeration going on over, uh, over the set S. So there's some sort of, a, maybe, essentially it's a, it's, it is a semi-infinite problem. Later on, I'll show that you can just restrict S to also be its integer elements. All right, but but this is the dual problem, and and so the precise statement is that <coughs> if you assume uh, C to be what I mentioned, with this uh, C two part being pointed, and uh, at least in the statement of the theorem, I assume uh, that we are also bounded on the continuous variables. Then basically, we can show that this in soup problem that I just showed gives a strong dual. But there are two cases that I've put, and uh, I wanted to cut down on notation as much as possible, so I just paraphrased a lot of things. Uh, but basically, there are two cases when, when the problem itself is full dimensional, right? So remember, I did not have any equality constraints in, in my formulation, but they could be implied, right, through the conic constraints. But if the problem is full dimensional, then the proof uh, is much, well, not easy, but it's, uh, it's less cumbersome, so to say. Uh, the tricky part is really handling uh, the low dimensional case, especially when we have to give a certificate of strong duality. Uh, the low dimensional case is much more challenging. But still, we can do that. Now, one remark I'd like to make is, uh, so basically when we sent this paper out a few months ago and then we got our referee reports back, so one of the this thing was, oh, but you're assuming, uh, at least in the first revision, we're just assuming that the set is bounded, the, that the problem feasible set is bounded. And we got a feedback saying that, oh, but you're assuming this is bounded, so what can you say about unbounded? So one of the things that we are working on right now is getting around this boundedness condition. And one thing that we think is going to go through is, uh, instead of being bounded, we assume that the relaxation is a thin set, right? So for uh, for those who don't know what a thin set basically just means that you look at every direction in the polar and the supremum in that direction is finite, all right? Um, so of course, bounded sets are thin. Um, and I think if you allow for general thin sets, it will all go through. All right, so I guess I'm being flagged, but I just have two slides. As you can see, I'm on slide 13 of 14. So there's one slide and next slide and, and I'll be done. All right, so I just wanted to put, uh, because I claim that, okay, we have this convex hull description. So I just wanted to put a slide. I know it's very messy, a lot of notation. I'm not gonna bother explaining everything, but I just wanted to give a sense of what these extended and projected formulations look like. So the one on top is basically an extended formulation. As you can see, it's, it's a formulation uh, involving the original x variables, but there are all these um, u variables, which is what makes the extension. So there is like u1, u2, and each of these u's is a uh, is a vector, okay? Um, so basically, yeah, it's a, it's a very nasty looking thing, but one nice thing is is that the constraints are, are sparse, well, fairly sparse. If you look at uh, sparse in the sense that at least the coefficients are plus minus one or zero in the first two sets of constraints. <clears throat> now going to the projected part, so the bottom part, basically if you, the idea is you take this extended formulation and you, you take the part of the constraints involving the u variables, right? And you can write this formulation as like some ax plus bu less than right hand side h, right? And so then you take this bu part, just like you do with projection cones with polyhedra, 
you take the adjoint of the B, you build this cone that I've written at the bottom, and then every extreme ray of this cone will give you uh, will give you a cut in the X space. And basically, the point is, since this is a projection result, we have an extended formulation which is ideal for the convex hull. So projecting this gives us the convex hull in the X space. Right, so so basically all valid inequalities of the form that I've written a star pi and uh, right hand side pi times h for every pi extreme ray uh, describes the convex hull. And these are linear because as you can see, the, these inequalities are, are linear in x. All right, so one last slide as, as I uh, so as part of proving uh, this uh, um, this theorem on strong duality. I didn't go through the steps because there's absolutely no time within half an hour to explain the steps, but, but the idea was first we had to do a transformation of the set to what is called as a packing set. So one of the nice things that we discovered is there are different notions of defining what it means to be packing. So I've given one definition of on top. The other definition was, I talked a few slides ago about some, some decomposability. So that is also there. So there's a nice relation that we sort of analyze and develop between all these different properties. So you have this universal set of convex sets, then you have cones and conic representable sets within convex sets. And so for example, the sum decomposable set, right? So if you intersect those with the set of all cones, then you get exactly the faces of the cones, right? So the, as I said in the definition that this should remind you of face of a cone, and that's exactly that. Then this notion of packing that I've defined on top um, intersected with uh, what are called as packs, then you get strongly packing. So this is basically a Venn diagram that sort of tells you the relationship between um, cones, conic sets, and, and their packing properties. So that's something that we thought would be of independent interest and is we anyway needed this for our analysis, the properties of packing sets. So. Uh, that was like a nice aside uh, that, that we got from this.